Manasquan. So this is some of the beginning seeds uh, being sown to that end. Okay? All right. You can open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to continue our series through the book of Matthew. And before we jump into it, I'm going to ask Frank Martinez, if you wouldn't mind, to come pray for our time in the Word. Is that okay, Frank? Thanks, Frank. I tried to catch it earlier to let you know I was going to do that, but you were up there gabbing away, as you do. <laughs> it's a thing God blessed me with. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh. Thank you, Lord. Father God, thank you for all you do, Lord, for just creating the heavens and earth, and creating everything in it, seen and unseen. Father God, we just thank you and honor you and praise your wonderful name, Lord. And Father God, we come before you this morning in honor of you, Father God, that you sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for us, Father God, so that we didn't have to live in misery, Lord. And we thank you for that. Father God, may the words that Pastor Chris preach this morning, penetrate our hearts, Father God, and may we walk out of here different people than when we walked in, and may you just have the Holy Spirit sit upon us, Father God, throughout the day, dwelling in us, Father God, that we can just do your will in our lives, Lord. May we keep you in our souls and our minds throughout the day and throughout the week, Father God, so that this way we can be a use for you into your kingdom, Father God. We thank you. We thank you for the gathering. We thank you for everybody that's here, Father God. And Lord, we just, we praise your wonderful name. And in Jesus Christ we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. So Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to tell you guys right off the bat what the title of today is going to be. I'm going to call it, Why Fault Finders Can't Find Rest. Last week, we dove into this theme of rest, Jesus saying, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. And today, we're going to continue that theme. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I can play two different roles in my life. I, I can play two different roles simultaneously. At one time, I can be a very needy person where I, I, I'm expressing my need to God. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your strength. God, I need your provision. God, I need your uh, direction, healing. And then at the same time, right, so I'm a needy person on my knees. God, I need you. And at the same time, I can be the person behind that guy with a whip, like a taskmaster. Ah, you don't deserve it. You didn't work hard enough. Yesterday, you made some stupid decisions. Right? You, you, you shouldn't have said that to that person. You don't deserve healing. Anybody else struggle with that? You kind of can beat yourself up, and then sometimes you can take that fault-finding tendency, and you can turn it on other people, and you can look for the faults in others. Sometimes we uh, justify it by saying, well, I need to call out their sin. I need to help them by calling out their sin, and there is a time and a place for that. Absolutely. We're called to look out for each other in that way. If somebody's struggling with something, if Frank struggling with something, I want to say, hey, Frank, I think this is, this is going to hurt you. You need to deal with this. But sometimes we can, we can slip into fault-finding mode. We're on the hunt to police everyone's behavior or a particular person's behavior. And we're just offended by them, and so we find every little thing wrong with them. That's a tendency that I think we all have or are prone to. Sometimes the grace that God offers other people can actually make us a little resentful. It's a threat to how hard we've worked for something. We feel like we've been a good little boy or girl for Jesus, for God, and somebody else gets blessed in a way that we're not being blessed. And it's like, what, man, they look at their life. What a mess they are. How could God bless them? And it feels like a threat to us working so hard. Like, what's the point of me doing all that I just did? If I'm not going to get blessed like this person just got blessed. And so then we... we, 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 we creates this offense towards God, and then we continue to find faults in other people. That's a tendency we all have. We're going to look at this story today in Matthew 12, or, or this one passage that has two stories in it. Um, and, and it's two stories that take place on the Sabbath day. And, and on this particular Sabbath day, Jesus is criticized by the religious leaders for how 
Uh, he lives out the Sabbath day, what he allows his disciples to do on the Sabbath day, what he does on the Sabbath day. And we're going to see why he gets criticized, and we're going to see what his response to his critics are. And I think there's going to be some things in there for us. We're going to kind of focus on two questions as we go through this passage. Number one, what does this reveal about Jesus? Like, what does this reveal about who Jesus is? And num number two, how are we to live in light of who Jesus is? How are we to live in light of who Jesus is? Because if there is a fault-finding tendency in all of us that steals our rest, steals our peace, then we want to be prepared to repent of that and turn back to the Jesus who said in a, chapter 11, which we ended with, I'm going to show you what we ended with last week. Can I show you that? Can I give us a running start of sorts? So we're, we're focusing on Matthew 12, 1 to 14, but here's where it ended last week. He said, come to me all who are weary and burned and I will give you rest. That's the invitation and a command. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. A yoke, as we talked about last week, you put it on animals, you put it on like two ox, they'd be yoked together. A more experienced ox would be yoked to a less experienced one and, and the more experienced one would kind of pull them along, guide them along kind of train him as he's learning, as he's growing. And by the time of, of, of Jesus, the, the word yoke was used to refer to a particular uh, religious leader's, rabbi's interpretation of the law of Moses. In order to obey this command, they might say, you need to follow X, Y, to come up with a formula for it, their interpretation of, of so like you're, that was their yoke that they'd put on their followers. And if you're going to live up to God's commandment here, these are the expectations. So, for example, the Sabbath day, God said don't work on the Sabbath day. Well, there was different, what, what does that mean? What, can, what am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? And, and they had different interpretations. Can I carry something? How far can I carry it? How many feet can I carry it? Can I walk? How far can I walk? These were the questions that they were trying to figure out. These formulas, it got so elaborate and so uh, cumbersome. Uh, this is a commentator, David Guzik, uh, quoting, uh, or I'm quoting <laughs> commentator David Guzik. Uh, he said this, At this time, many rabbis filled Judaism with elaborate rituals related to the Sabbath and observance of other laws. Ancient rabbis taught that on the Sabbath, a man could not carry something in his right hand or in his left hand, across his chest or on his shoulder. But he could carry something with the back of his hand, with his foot, elbow, or in the ear, or on the hair, in the helm of his shirt, or in his shoe or sandal. On the Sabbath, one was forbidden to tie a knot, except a woman could tie a knot in her girdle. So if a bucket of water had to be raised from a well, one could not tie a rope to the bucket, but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket and then to the rope. That's how elaborate and cumbersome it was. So when Jesus said, come to me all who are weary... It was in part speaking of this elaborate formula that the religious leaders were laying on the people. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not measuring up. Oh, I got, caught you. Screwed up. Gotcha. And that was the heavy yoke that was being put on people. And Jesus is like, come, come to me. Come to me. I'm going to give you a lighter yoke. My commands are not cumbersome like that. I'm going to put my spirit in you that will give you the desire to obey my commands, and I'm going to give my power to obey those commands. It's not going to feel heavy and burdensome. You're going to delight in my laws. You're going to delight in my commands. You're going to be able to rest. You're not going to follow these commands in order to earn my favor, but because you have my love, because you have my favor, because you are declared righteous already through my sacrifice. That's what he was inviting his people into. I will give you rest. And so this flows, this passage flows right into uh, chapter 12. Re remember um, that in original manuscript, there was no chapter breaks. They flowed together. So the, when Jesus said, come to me all who are weary, I'll give you rest, that flowed right into this story that we're jumping into in chapter 12. So here we go. Verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. Now when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now, the law of Moses allowed people who were traveling through to pick gleanings from fields as they, as they went. 
and that was not considered stealing. They could grab, they could pick some heads of grain, they could grab it for a little meal. Not to hoard it, not to load up their suitcases full of it, but to, to grab it for a little meal. In fact, those who owned the crops were commanded by God to leave extra gleanings for the poor, for the foreigner, for those passing through. Leave extras. Leave the, leave the leftovers. The problem was that these disciples were picking on the Sabbath day. And the religious leaders, within their yoke, within their interpretation of what it meant to obey the Sabbath, they had said, you cannot do this on the Sabbath. That was work. That was harvesting. That was picking too much. So God did not forbid it. This wasn't in the law of Moses. This was in the oral tradition of the teachers of the law with their attempt to come up with a bunch of checklists. So they were saying, you can't do that on the Sabbath day. Uh, it was a little extra, an add-on, much like uh, the Catholic Church might say a priest cannot marry. It's, a, it's an add-on. The Bible doesn't say that. It's an add-on. Or sometimes churches will say Christians shouldn't drink any alcohol. The Bible doesn't say that. That's an add-on that we've added to, to be safe, to be careful. Um, and, and, and that's presumably what some of them wanted to do. Let's just be safe and be careful and have a bunch of rules. This is what it means. Let's protect ourselves. And so it leads to them finding fault with Jesus. Apparently, they were watching Jesus. you got to wonder, what were they doing out in the grain fields with Jesus and his disciples? Right? I, I, mean, I, I don't know. But they're, Jesus is with his disciples over there. And I'm just wondering if they're like, hmm, what are they doing? Watching them. Like, like political minions who try to get dirt on the, 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 the opponent. Right? We're going to find them. We're going to get our, photography, our camera and take some pictures. Stick it in the tabloids, right? They're out to get them. That's what fault finders do. They're out to dig up dirt on somebody. Verse 3. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry? He and his companions. How he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone. So Jesus goes back to references David, King David, their ancestor, their hero. I mean, they were waiting for the Messiah to come through the line of David to bring in a kingdom, much like the kingdom that David had. So David's their hero, and Jesus is reminding them, don't you remember back in the day when he was on the run from King Saul? Him and his men were desperate for food. They went into the house of God, and the priests allowed them to take the showbread that nobody could eat. But they allowed David to take it because he was desperate, because he was needy, because he was the anointed king. Saul was on the throne as king, but David had been anointed to become king, and he was on his way to his enthronement, and the priests allowed David to have it. And Jesus is saying, don't you remember that the bread was given to David and his followers? And what's Jesus saying? He's comparing himself to David. He's comparing himself to a, an anointed king who is on his way to his enthronement. Much like Jesus had been anointed to be king at his baptism. And he's on his way to his enthronement at the cross. He's claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be the, the anointed one through the line of David. And he's saying, if David and his followers could do it, how much more this king, the true and better king, and his followers get grain from the grain fields if they're hungry. And then he says in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law? Let on the Sabbath the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and yet are innocent. So the Sabbath day, uh, God said, don't work. And the, the purpose of that was to trust him. Honor the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Set it apart. This is a day to, to rest in God as provider. That was the purpose of it. But the priests in the temple, they're going to work. They're going to slaughter the animals. They're going to pick up those animals. They're going to carry. They're going to move around. And everybody was okay with it. Pharisees were okay with it. Religious leaders were okay, okay with it. Why? Because they're keeping up the work of the temple. The temple is where God's presence meets earth. And Jesus is like, of, of course you're okay with that. Because it, the, the temple system is more important than the priests taking a day off. And Jesus then says next, But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. And this is big. This is huge. We've got to get this. We've got to get this. The temple where God met earth, where the heaven comes together on earth. That was the point of the temple. 
And Jesus is saying, I've become the new temple. I'm where heaven meets earth. I'm where God's presence is made available for the people. And this will help us understand what he says next about the Sabbath day. In verse 7, he says, If you had known what this means, I desire compassion rather than sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So it's okay for David to eat from the tabernacle. It's okay for priests to serve and work in the temple. And therefore, it's okay for me and my disciples, if we're hungry, we can get grain from the grain fields. We're, 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 we're to eat if, if we need to eat because the point of the Sabbath is to bless mankind. That was God's purpose, to rest in God's blessing. And so you guys, you Pharisees who are putting this yoke of you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, you're actually making the Sabbath a form of work. You're making the Sabbath a form of earning salvation. You're making the Sabbath a, a way of checking boxes, and that's not what the point of the, service, of the Sabbath was meant to be. They had created a formula that people had to follow, and in their desire to get the ordinances right, in, in, in their desire to, to control the system, they missed God's heart for the needy, for the hurting, for those who needed something and needed God to provide it. And that's why he said, you guys aren't getting this mercy piece. That was the point. You're going through the motions. You got the sacrifices, but you're missing mercy. You're missing God's heart. God wants to bring rest for the weary. Blessing to the needy. Fault finders use God's commands to find fault in others. Their desire is not to point people to Jesus to rest in him and his grace. It's to use the Bible to find fault in people and to pick them apart. And we all have a tendency to go there. Myself included. But then Jesus says the, the most offensive thing of all. In verse 8, he says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Son of Man is a reference to the Messiah. It, 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 it's, it's a claim to be the anointed one. And Lord of the Sabbath, I mean, that's a claim to deity. That's a claim to being God. This is huge. He's not just challenging their idea of the Sabbath. He's not just saying you're missing God's heart and what God intended for the Sabbath. He's saying, I am in charge of the Sabbath. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I've come up with the Sabbath. I've decided the purpose for the Sabbath. I'm the fulfillment of the Sabbath. That's why in the previous chapter, it ended with him saying, come to me and I will give you rest. He is that rest. He is what the Sabbath day was meant to point to. He is what the Sabbath day was meant to be a foreshadow of. It's fulfilled in Jesus. So just like Jesus is the ultimate temple, he is our ultimate Sabbath rest. Just like he was our ultimate temple, he is our ultimate Sabbath rest. He is where the presence of God meets earth, and he is where we get rest from our heavy burdens. Another way to put it, true rest is not found in a day, it's found in a person. It's not found in checking off boxes on a particular day, it's found in going to him. And from the standpoint of the Pharisees, what they are hearing him say to them is, you guys are no longer in charge of the rules. I'm taking that away from you. You are no longer in charge of deciding what people need to do and not do in order to find rest in me. It's out of your hands now. Your, your day is over. The Jewish law in the Bible was different than the oral tradition. And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of my Father's laws that were written in Scripture that you guys have twisted and turned into a heavy yoke that you have put on each other. And you have become fault finders, and you have become experts in what everyone else is doing wrong, and I'm taking that away. And when he compares himself to the temple and the Sabbath, he's saying, I believe he's saying that there's coming a day when just like the temple will not be needed, the sacrificial system will not be needed, the temple, the physical temple would be destroyed in AD 70. It's not needed anymore. Jesus is the true temple. He puts his spirit in the church. The church is now the temple on earth. I believe he was also saying there's coming a point when that seventh day Sabbath is no longer going to be needed because I am the fulfillment of it. 
Just like we don't have to go to a physical temple for God's presence, we do have to go to Jesus. Same thing with the Sabbath. We don't have to take off all work on the seventh day in order to find rest, but we do have to go to Jesus. Now, there are people who will disagree with that, and Sabbatarians who will say, no, no, you, we still should obey the seventh-day Sabbath, and I get their argument for it, and I respect it, and I don't think they're crazy for thinking that way. I, I, I respect it. I just don't agree with that. I think just like the temple system ended, so does the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, that said, I do believe there's wisdom in having a day off, a day off that's different than the rest of the week, a day off where we can rest. If we can't stop, if we can never stop going, 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 that shows, I believe, that we're trying to find validation through our accomplishments, through our to-do list, through working, and that shows that we're probably not resting in Jesus. If we can't start our days with him or end our days with him or take time in our day to be with him, and we've got to always we say, we, we say we're too busy, there's a sense in which, okay, we've made ourselves too important, our to-do list too important, we're not resting in him. So I think there's wisdom in that, but I don't believe it has to be the, seb- the seventh day. And it goes beyond that. It goes beyond the seven days. It goes beyond time with Jesus. It goes, it, it goes to the heart of this, this passage, the fault finders. The fault finders are not resting in Jesus. When we are in fault finding mode, it's an indication that we are no longer finding our rest in Jesus. We are finding our peace, our pseudo peace, a false peace, by pointing out the faults of others, the flaws of others. I don't know if you guys get this, but I can get a little bit of a dopamine rush when I can point out the wrongs in somebody else. Anybody else? A tiny little dopamine rush, and then it wears off. And it's like, well, who, who else is messed up around here? You know, let me point something else out. Like, you can get into a mode, a mood, a, a groove, where you just kind of get into a fault-finding mode. I can do it around the house. And I, like, w- walk in. I'm like, all right, who's, who's wrong today? Who's, what's, what's off today? Anybody? And there's a sense of peace that you get, and usually it's because I'm not at rest in Jesus. I'm not at rest in Jesus, and so I'm looking to find faults in others. I'm looking to satisfy my justice button, my craving for justice. Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire, he's saying to the religious leaders, that you would see in others their need for me and the rest that people can find in me and point them to me, not look for a reason to condemn them, not look for reasons why they're not measuring up. None of, us, none of y'all measure up, Jesus is saying, so come to me for your rest. Come to me for your righteousness, your forgiveness. It's funny because they're so focused on their to-do list and their rules and their check boxes that they were actually, in being rule followers, they were actually rebelling against God's heart. Because God's heart was for people resting in him as the ultimate rest, and they're making it hard. They were not submitting to that. They were not submitting to him as the, the, the source of rest, and they're making it hard for others. Let me pause and ask a question right now, if we can be honest with ourselves for a moment. Are you a fault finder right now? Let's just talk about this moment. Who finds a fake peace in criticizing others? I'm not, you know, you don't have to yell out. You can if you want to, but. (laughs) But just ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, like, am I? Is this me right now? Am I in this mode? Yeah, Jesus, I just pray that you would show us right now. Is there, is there, is there um, people in general or a particular person that we just can't help but focus on and look for their faults? Look for where they're not measuring up to our expectations. I was reminded of a, um, a few years ago, a woman, uh, well, I shouldn't say gender, you might try to guess. A person came to me, scratched that from the record. It could have been a man. <laughs> um, they came to me and they said, they were, they, had, they were had a complaint about two other leaders in our church. This was a few years ago. And they said, yeah, when, you know, they do X, Y, and Z, I don't understand it, and, we can, you know, got to fix it. And I said, are you saying that what they're doing is a sin? 
or is it just not measuring up to your philosophy of doing things? And they were like, okay, I guess it's just my philosophy of doing things. I was like, okay, thanks for being honest. You can certainly still go and say, hey, guys, I would appreciate it if we're working together that you do X, Y, and Z, but you can't come at it like it's a sin that you're going to come down on, right? That's what sometimes we do. Somebody's not doing it. It's not even in the sin category scripturally. It's just they're not doing it the way I would do it. I see this, we see this with the, in the church with all kinds of things. Like, I, I can't believe so-and-so is not serving in this particular ministry, and they don't care about Jesus like I care about Jesus, or reaching people like I care about reaching people. We've seen it with, with justice issues in, our, in the past couple of years. I've seen this with justice issues, right? The Bible condemns any kind of prejudice, ethnic, racial. It also tells us to stand up for the unborn. Unborn have, have life, and we're to care for the oppressed and the vulnerable, right? And so that's two things our church wants to care about, is, 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 is racial reconciliation and justice for the unborn. But if somebody's not doing things exactly the way we want them to do it, right? If somebody doesn't put up a Black Lives Matter thing on social media, then, oh, therefore, they don't care about racism. Or if somebody doesn't go to a pregnancy center banquet, oh, therefore, they don't care about the unborn. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not be so quick to check people off and grade them according to our own expectations, right? Because we add formulas to what the Bible says. Well, this is, must be what it means to be part of a church. You're doing this ministry and that ministry and that ministry. It's like, well, not exactly. Just because you're not serving in the kids' ministry doesn't mean you don't love kids, right? We can't put that on each other. That's sort of an aside, but I wanted to give it as an example. Let's continue. Second passage. Going from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there, so man's there, shriveled hand, right? Let's set the scene. Jesus is there. A man with a shriveled hand is there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So the religious leaders are there. They're still watching him like a hawk, right? Man with a shriveled hand, Jesus, religious leaders. There's this tension. What's he going to do? It's a showdown. The man with the withered hand is like a pawn in their game. They're looking to bring a charge against Jesus. He is a threat to their system. He's a threat to their position of authority. He's a threat to them being on the top. That's what man reigned religion does. It, it gives us a way to be on top of others, right? And Jesus is a threat, so they're like, oh, let's see if he's going to heal. Because you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. According to their oral tradition, you're not supposed to heal. So, Jesus ain't, so they're watching him. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? Look how Jesus responds. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? Of course they will. It's an urgent matter. It's your sheep. Get, get them out of the, the pit. God understands. That's, that's, it's, also, it's okay to, to lift that kind of load to save your sheep. Right? See where Jesus is going. Now, before we um, get to the next verse, I would imagine that the religious leaders would be okay if a person fell in a pit. Because that's urgent. Get them out. You know, life-threatening. You know, like, let's, let's, if it's a life-threatening issue, okay, we can do it. This man had a withered hand. They, like, it's, he, he can wait till tomorrow to be healed. That's what they were going for. He can wait till tomorrow. You don't have to do it now. This is a chronic condition. This is, it's like the ER treats you, right? If you're not about to die, you're waiting for six hours over there. Right? If you're about to die, okay, we'll let you in, an exception. Otherwise, six-hour wait, go over there. Right? That's what they were doing. They had their system. They were in charge of the ER, so to speak. And they were saying, this guy doesn't, it's not an emergency. It's not urgent. He doesn't need to be healed right now. And Jesus says, how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Sorry, animal lovers, but the Bible does say, I'm an animal lover myself, but the Bible does say human beings are more valuable to God than sheep are. Animals are. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It's lawful to do good. It's lawful to bless. The whole point, again, of the Sabbath is for people to find rest in God, to be blessed by God, to receive from God, to stop trying to do, do, do in order to earn, earn, earn. It's to be blessed. It's to receive. It's to say, I'm needy. And to receive from God. And that's what Jesus wants to show, that he's a giver. He's a blesser. He's, he's a provider. He's a healer. Now, how do they respond? 
Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. And so he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Now, this is interesting. He says to stretch out the man's hand. If the guy's hand is withered, he can't stretch it out. It's like telling a guy in a wheelchair, hey, I'm going to heal you. Just come on and walk over here, and I'll heal you over here. It's like, uh, wait a second. I'm, I'm in the, the wheelchair, right? But, but this guy was told to, to do something that he couldn't do in his own strength. And he must have had the faith to believe Jesus is going to meet him there. So he makes the willful decision to stretch out his hand. And as he makes that effort, God meets him and he's healed. It kind of simultaneously happens at the same time. He stretches it out. Jesus heals him. His hand is restored. This chronic condition that he's had for who knows how long. This is what he was known as, the man with the withered hand. That guy with the thing on his hand. Guy with the problem. Right? That's kind of how he was thought of. He was labeled. And then all of a sudden, this one day, after having struggled with this for how many, we don't know how long, all of a sudden, Jesus heals him. And he heals him outside of the system for when the Pharisees say he's allowed to heal him. Which, again, it's interesting. They had, they had faith to believe Jesus would heal this guy. Ain't that interesting? They had full faith to believe that Jesus would heal this guy. They just weren't willing to submit to that power. They could see it. They just didn't like it. They could acknowledge that Jesus had power. They just didn't like that he had power. Because it was a threat to, his, to their system. And then how do they respond? Look what they did. The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. They see a miracle. A man's hand restored. And they're like, ah, got him. They use it to build a case against him. And they go out and go, okay, now we got something we can work with here. Ain't that crazy? How blind fault-finding mode can make us. We can't even celebrate the blessings of others. We see it as an offense to us. How dare he do that? How dare God show mercy to that person? How dare God show grace to that person? They didn't earn it. They didn't clean themselves up yet. How dare God answer that prayer and bless that person with healing, bless that person with provision, give them that beautiful new house, Look at how messed they are. They didn't even apologize yet for what they did. That's where fault-finding mode takes us. Off of Jesus, unable to celebrate others, sometimes jealous of others. I've had conflicts in the past where I felt misunderstood or falsely accused by someone. And then later on, I found out that something negative happened, and there was a part of me that was like, huh, well, that makes sense. I know that's despicable, right? I hope I'm not alone. Um, But it's despicable to think that way, as if random bad things don't happen to us all, right? Or I find out something good happens, and there's a part of me that's like, that doesn't make sense. Something's not right about that. There needs to be justice, right? How could, it, how could God just go on blessing them as if what they did to me never happened? Sometimes it's our offense that leads us to fall into fault-finding mode. But it steals our peace, and that's why the title was Why Fault Finders Can't Find Rest. We need to be freed from that. And the good news is that Jesus invites all of us, including fault finders, come to me and you'll find rest. Not just rest from the burdens being laid on you by fault finders, telling you you have to earn and justify and prove, but you'll rest from yourself. Remember in the beginning I talked about the dual roles I can play, beating myself up? Jesus is like, I want to free you from that old taskmaster. He's not your king. You don't serve King Chris, the taskmaster. You serve me. Come to me. I'll give you rest. King Chris won't. Never be good enough for King Chris. He'll always find a reason to beat you up, tell you you're not doing good enough. So we're going to receive communion in a moment. And the band's going to sing over us first. They're going to sing a song over us. We can stay seated. The band, you guys can come on up here. And as we prepare to receive communion, I just want to walk us through four things that I believe this story reminds us about as it relates to communion.
If you, by the way, if you don't have the communion elements, you can put your hand up and the ushers will uh, put it in your hand. If you're not a follower of Jesus or you still have questions about Jesus, feel, feel no pressure to receive this with us. That would be uh, insincere and just a, a religious thing that we don't want you to have to do. Um, if you are a follower of Jesus, we invite you to take part in this, even if you're visiting from another church. But, but this passage, here's what this tells me. There's four things. N- number one, uh, communion is a time to remember that Jesus is our source of rest. Uh, we've been saying that since last week. That he's our source of rest. Why? Because his body was given, represented by this cracker, and his blood was spilled, represented by this juice. We don't have to earn. Even when it comes to the commands of God that he wants for us, that we will still screw up with, Jesus is like, come on, I'll help you. I'll help you grow in that area. I forgive you. I forgive you. I'm going to help you grow in that area. I'm going to help you grow in that area. He's our source of rest. Not our earning, not our work, not checking the boxes, not living up to others' expectations. There's not peace in that. There's not peace in that. Even when we're doing good and we get pats on the back from other people, it's a pseudo peace, it's a fake peace, it's superficial, it doesn't last. So that's number one. Number two, Jesus is a blesser, a giver, a provider, a healer, all out of his mercy. We do not earn the blessings, the provision. Those two stories, him feeding his disciples, him healing a man with a withered hand, it's out of his mercy. This communion, let me put it a different way. This communion tells us that if I had a bad week or a bad day yesterday where I sinned mightily and I'm in need of healing today and I ask for it, I'm not any less likely to receive that healing than I was last week when I had a really good week. That's what this means because it's not based on my week. It's not based on my report card. It's based on the righteousness that Jesus has robed me with. His robes of righteousness put around me. Jesus, I need healing. Jesus, I need you fill in the blank. When you receive this communion, ask for it. God, I need provision right now. I need wisdom. I don't know how to handle this situation. Help me. Number three, communion is a time to remember that we are called to stretch out our hand in neediness and faith. So we should acknowledge our neediness. I wonder how many of those religious leaders who were criticizing Jesus, I don't know how many were there, but I wonder if there was one or two in the group who had their own needs. Maybe their own need for healing or a family member who needed healing. And I wonder if there was part of them that was tempted. Man, if this guy's doing these miracles, I'd love for him to come heal my sister. But if I ask for it, it's going to acknowledge that he has power. And it's going to acknowledge that I'm in need. And it's going to be a threat to my position. And so let me just keep my mouth shut. And I think sometimes we do that. If I acknowledge I'm needy, it's going to put me in a vulnerable spot. I don't want to be vulnerable. I like feeling like I have it all together. And faith. The man stretched out his hand. Sometimes faith. Coming to Jesus. Taking a step. Believing that he will meet that need. And then lastly, communion is a time to remember that we are called to repent of our fault-finding tendencies. Because there's no rest in it, it's a chance to say, you know what, Jesus? You desire mercy, not sacrifice. You desire not me jumping through the hoops, not me coming to church and singing the songs while I'm looking at a brother or sister or a group of people trying to find fault in them to prop myself up. This is a reminder His mercy has been poured out on me. And he desires for me to take that mercy, let it fill me to overflowing with such gratitude for his mercy that it pours out on others. Because as much as we may be experts in the faults of others, (laughs) God knows our faults. And he, 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 he sees the depths of our hearts in ways that we don't see it. So, so I, I shared last week, I, I can struggle with people getting away with stuff. I can, I can, it starts with concern. It starts with care. 
All right? Hey, Lisa. Hey, Steve. Hey, Justin. I'm concerned about you. But when I can't persuade them, I'm like, hmm, let me figure out another way. Let me get it this angle. Let me get this angle. And I can't. And I have trouble trusting. Okay, God, you're in control. You convict them in your time. You show them in your time. I can have trouble with that. And one reason is because I can have a sensitive justice button. I don't like the idea of people getting away with things. But this is a reminder, man, I got away with a lot. I get away with a lot. People don't call me out on as much as they should, probably. I don't know what's in my heart. But Jesus is like, oh, my mercy is poured out on you. My mercy is poured out on you, and I want you to pour it out on others. So we're going to let the band sing over us, and then, we'll, and then we'll receive this together. So just reflect. Reflect.